Hey, I'm Will. This is Cover Minute. We're going to be taking a look at Catan, or Settlers of Catan, as it was it used to be called by Klaus Tober. And uh, this is a two to four player game where you are building settlements and cities as you spread across the board and in a race to collect victory points before other players of the game. There is a heavy negotiation aspect to this, uh, but really it's all about how you use your resources in the best way possible. So I will give you a explanation on how to play the game. Uh, I'm not going to do a playthrough of this because uh, it is just me here today and there is no official solo mode for the standard game of Catan, but I will give you my review afterwards. So let's head down and uh, learn how to play. So here we have the game set up and this is a two to four player game, but the setup will be the same regardless of player count. There is a recommended setup in the rule book for new players, but I do recommend you just dive right into the full game setup. Uh, which is both easier to do because you don't have to sort the tiles separately, but uh, it's also it lets you kind of dive into some of the more strategies of the game. What you're going to do is you're going to randomly lay out all the different landscape tiles. You're going to put the frame around in also a, uh, you can fold the numbers, in, but I don't think it really matters. You're going to place random port tiles around where each of the ports are located, as well as random number tiles, with the robber always starting in the desert. And then it's time for you to begin the early deployment or sort of drafting phase. So this is what uh, we call a snake draft. So, which means that the first player will place um, a settlement in a road first, and then the second player, then the third player, then the fourth player, and then the we do it again in reverse. So the fourth, third, and second, and then first. For the rules of this, you must place your city, or sorry, your, um, your settlement on any junction in between three different tiles. It could be on the corner or edges of the board if you so choose. And once you place your settlement there, you are gonna place a road leading away from it in any direction you choose. Now for future um, placements, you must only place settlements or cities in the, in the later game case, at least two lengths away from another settlement. So placing here would not be legal. You'd have to place it up to two away. And then of course you could have a road. Roads may only ever be one road per length or uh, or, uh, or side in between the tiles. You can never pass over each other's road, but you can eventually uh, do something like this where the road changes directions because there's nothing there to block it. Uh, continuing on, so each player is gonna place theirs. And then when you get back to in turn to placing your second one, it, it doesn't have to be connected to the first. It could be somewhere across the board, uh, you know, or maybe you do want to have it to start connecting to the first, that is legal as well. Once you are done that, setup is complete, and you can begin the play. Each player's turn is going to be very simple. You're going to be rolling the dice. The game comes with a pair of dice, and once you roll it, whatever number is rolled, anyone who has a settlement or city bordering one of those numbers is going to get a resource card of the type that matches that landscape type. So for example, if I roll an 11 here, that means that I'm gonna get one brick because I have a red settlement next to a brick with a number 11 on it. So I'm gonna get one of those. This is gonna be the same for everybody at the same time simultaneously. Whether it is their turn or not, they are gonna receive a resource based on the number types that they have built next to. Unless, of course, the robber has been placed on top of your number, obscuring it, and I'll get to how that works in a second. So once you've collected all of your resources, now we are going to do some trading and then some buying some things, and then your turn be over. So there is one special case for rolling, which is seven, and that is associated with the robber. 
So if you roll a seven first, all players will check their hands to see if they have seven or more resources, uh, or sorry, more than seven resources. If they do, they have to discard half, round it down, so favoring the player. And then the player whose turn it is gets to move the robber from its current location and has to move it. They don't get a choice to leave it. They have to move it and place it on another number. Once upon placing, if there is a opponent's set city or settlement next to the robber, they may steal a random resource from that player. Uh, and it's got to be one of the resource cards randomly from their hand. So you are going to keep your cards secretly once you've got them. What this does, as you've seen, like I alluded to earlier, is that it's covering the number, meaning that even if that number is rolled, that player will no longer receive resources until they can move the robber at a later time. Then you can choose to do uh, as many trading and purchasing of buildings as you wish. Trading is pretty much whatever you choose. You are doing trades with the other players in the games. Uh, you um, can you know make offers. You can take offers. Uh, you know I recommend that you. Try to speed this part of the game along because it can take a long time if uh, if you'd let. But you know maybe it'll say you know I'll give you two sheep for a, a wheat or one to one or whatever you choose. You can also make trades to ports. So I mentioned the various ports around the board. If you have a settlement at one of the ports, you can trade at a special rate. Now at any time you can always trade four of the same resource for one resource of your choice, the bank. But being at a port, having a settlement or a city at the port gives you a special rate, depending on what the port is. So this port, for example, is two to one for sheep. So I can trade to the bank two sheep for one resource of my choice. Uh, this can be great if you're getting a lot of a certain kind of resource, you may want to get to a port or take one of the, the wild any three resources, uh, sorry, three, three of a kind resources for one good of your choice. So it's a discount from the standard trading rate. So that's good to go for. Uh, then, uh, like I said, in between trading and uh, in building, well, let's take a look at the building costs. You can build as many things as you wish during your turn, um, up to however much resources you have. You obviously don't want to hoard resources or the robber is going to catch you and you can build a number of different things. So the most obvious one is a road, which is the sticks, as I mentioned before. You can place those leading from any of your buildings or from another road, but not overlapping another player's road. You can purchase a settlement, which, like I said, must be two spaces or two kind of corners away from one of your existing ones, and it must be connected by roads. This is obviously a core part of the game because now you're gonna get more resources. Of course, if you had multiple settlements, so if I rolled a six here, because I have two settlements, I would be getting two wheat from this location. The next thing you can do is you can purchase a city. A city is an upgrade of a settlement, so you have to have an existing settlement, and you replace it with one of these larger city tiles. Now what this does is that a city is going to collect two resources of the type that it is next to when that number is rolled. So if we're getting back to my example, if I roll a six, or if, or if any player rolls a six, my settlement is going to get one wheat, my city is going to get two wheat. So in this case, I would get a total of three wheat. And lastly, you can buy a development card. There is a deck of development cards here, and uh, there's really just kind of three varieties of cards in there. The one you'll see the most commonly is the Knight. The Knight allows you to play it to move the robber and do the action of the robber. So you would then get a steel resource uh, from an owner who is adjacent to wherever you move the robber to. Uh, you can, by the way, only play one card per turn. The green cards usually involve, uh, you know, masses of resources and and some different uh, gaining of special special things. And then there is the yellow cards, which are worth a victory point at the end of the game. So 
since this game is a race to 10 victory points, that could be uh, a step towards winning. Uh, and of course, in order to get those 10 victory points, you have, like I said, the yellow cards count as a point, settlements count as one point, and cities count as two points. There are also two bonus objectives. So there is the longest road objective. So if you're able to achieve five road segments connect all connected together in a single line, then you can grab this longest road achievement, which is worth two victory points. If any player were to build more than you, then you they will steal this card and they will gain those two points instead. So whoever has this will have two points. And there is another achievement for the largest army. So if you've played three knight cards, you could take the longest, ar the largest army achievement for two points, which again can be stolen from you if any player surpasses your current level of army. So whoever has the most uh, will gain that card. First to 10 points wins, and that's the game. Now let's head back up and I will give my review. Okay, and that is how to play Settlers of Catan, or Catan as it's been renamed. So, um, really, there is no theme. I know, uh, I'm, I do have to say at the beginning that there was some arguments over the theme of this game. Uh, we're not going to cover that in a review. They've renamed it. But largely, you're just spreading buildings around. It is it's a pretty themeless game. There's not a lot of attachments to the theme in this game. You know, it is uh, just a, a straight race to points with some basic resource trading and collecting. So, uh, in terms of what it does well, it is a not too long game, or it can be not too long, as long as players will keep their trading to a minimum or, or accelerate the speed of their trading. Uh, however, depending on the players, it can really bog things down if a lot of people are arguing or fighting over what the trade is going to be. Uh, obviously, the more players, the the longer. Uh, some versions of the games will play up to five players. Um, I also have, you know, there's a miniature version of the game I have for trading, uh, for trading, for traveling, which uh, has a weird plastic board. But uh, this game has, you really have to do hand it to uh, Clustober and uh, Catan because I don't know whether it was just in the right place at the right time. But Catan really did kind of kick the, or kickstart the, <laughs> which is, sorry for the term, uh, kickstart the adoption of Euro style board gaming into North America. Uh, I think it really kind of rode a wave where people were looking for more interactions uh, and smarter game designs, ones that were not based on silliness or just, you know, the 5,000th version of Monopoly that they've all seen before. You know, people were looking for something fresh and some new interesting ideas and designs, something that's clean, that's fun, to play for friends, not too complicated, um, but certainly more complicated than children's games. I think there was, a, there was a really a place in the market for, uh, you know, this style of game that people could play as couples or as friends when they got together. Uh, as an you know, alternative to, I don't know what, just sitting around talking or watching TV uh, or drinking or whatever the case may be. Uh, so it really kind of rode that wave and I think introduced a lot of people into the board gaming hobby. And uh, some people obviously still adore this game. Now, to bring up that side of the story, there uh, is a lot of, um, of unfounded hate for Catan in the board gaming community. But I think it's not because it's a bad game. I think it's just, it's popular to hate. Uh, you know, it's um, partially because it, uh, you know, you know, had a little bit of a bad rap earlier, partially because it got a lot of new players into the hobby who were very excited to play Catan and find more people to play Catan and who hadn't quite discovered that the hobby is quite a bit wider than Catan. But also I think people just got tired of it after a while. You know, there's a, only so many times you can play it, I think before you know you do start getting tired. Of course, some people love playing the same games over and over again. Uh, I mean, I personally like to experience lots of different games and new things and new mechanics and uh, new stories and new puzzles constantly. I mean, I've got uh, a board game review channel and a wall of games behind me. So I'm obviously not uh, the kind of person to play the same game 
you know, a hundred times. Uh, games I love will stick around and I will play many, many, many times. But I think uh, Catan just kind of got outplayed a little bit. Uh, and of course, it, it can slow down, like I've mentioned, uh, based on the player count. Board games, uh, or games of this can be a little bit volatile in the sense that it's dependent on the players and a little bit on the luck too. Uh, you know, sometimes the dice rolling can feel bad a little bit. Uh, you know, if you're not getting what you need and you're forced to trade or you're forced to do different things, there's obviously some strategy behind that and mitigating that, of course. But uh, some people may not like the feel of watching their opponent to get resource after resource after resource. And even though you took one of the more commonly rolled red numbers, you, there's not rolling your number or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, I think the, uh, so in terms of the game itself, putting the game into a, you know, into a void and not looking at the culture around the game, I do think Catan is a, is a smart design. You know, I think it does introduce, you know, the negotiating is necessary, especially with more players, because you're not going to have access to all the resources, especially at the beginning. It is just not fun to wait until you have four or something to trade in just so you can get that last brick you need to build a road. So I think that that part is smart. The, the game turns do flow pretty quickly. Uh, you know, you do have to almost math out the board slightly to find the most advantageous places. And it is a little bit of a race and jockeying for position to get those places. Uh, and then smart trading. Of course, uh, again, there, there is a little bit of a, uh, a downside with it being very player dependent. But I think that is again, mitigated by things like development cards that might either give you the extra point or remove the robber or you know, get you that little extra something you need if nobody's willing to trade with you. It's, a, it's an outlook. And there's a, a little bit of a nice arc to the game too where you start off with very little things and it slowly ramps up to the point where you're, you've got multiple cities and settlements on the board and you're getting lots of resources. And, uh, and the game starts picking up speed until it comes to the end. Um, and uh, probably a, a decent time too. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it can be a little bit long, sometimes it feels a little short. It probably averages out to a good length. And then of course, the replayability. While the game is uh, pretty much pretty consistent and small in its scope of rules, there is a lot of variability in how the board can be set up. So it's gonna feel a little bit different each time, you know, or do you wanna go for some of these, uh, you know, better trading ports and then focus on those resources so that you can kind of do your own big trades or uh, do you want to spread out, race for the longest road? You know, there's, there's enough variability in here and things to do that is going to stay fresh and fun for a long while. So, uh, I mean, I do recommend uh, if you are a, a board gamer and you've been playing for a long time in the hobby and have not yet checked out the Catan, you know, I think uh, it was a classic and revolutionized the board gaming world and really started the community. And I think it's still work, worth at least trying out or going back to. Uh, if you are new to the hobby, maybe you came in with Catan or uh, maybe you played at a friend's house and they're looking for how to play or you picked up your own copy. You know, in which case I say, you know, welcome and congratulations. This is an excellent game to get started on. You know, don't uh, don't listen to the haters. There is plenty of fun to be had. Uh, you know, if you're looking for expansions to try out, they uh, I would recommend the Seafarers. Uh, it does lengthen the game a bit, but adds some interesting new elements of islands. Um, or go look at some other games. You know, another uh, good entry point for the hobby, which is very popular, would be something like Ticket to Ride. Um, or as an as newer entry, something like Cascadia gives you uh, a different sort of game, different puzzly feel to it. Um, unfortunately for solo players, there's not a whole lot here. And uh, even though there may be a lot of variants online for solo play, because a lot of the, this game is about the, the uh, haggling um, and trading nature uh, of, of your opponents, I don't think that playing solo will really kind of capture the feel of the game very well. And the puzzle of playing the game itself is not really deep enough to keep you coming back as a solo player. So well, you'll have to skip it for that. But uh, otherwise, whether you keep in your collection uh, or not, uh, you know, I hope that you've uh, 
had a good time watching my review and uh, and Rose's explanation. If you want to check out some of our games on the channel, please uh, take a look and you feel free to watch the watch them. I do a lot of playthroughs, a lot of solo playthroughs as well. If you're looking to try out, uh, you know, a comforting or mind challenging solo game. And uh, thanks for watching.